Shades at Windmills Podcast. Welcome to the Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. I'm Rhombus Tix, and today I'm going to be reading from Air of Sunfire, Chapter 2, Mr. Wright and Mr. Kind. Mr. Wright slowly walked across the kitchen table of the Great Palace, seeking the advice of his brother. There was a slight limp in his walk, not great, but enough to know by sight that he was not scampering. If he had not known the tricks and back ways of the castle so well by now, he would surely have been caught and eaten. So it was with no small amount of relief that he finally arrived at Mr. Kind's doorway and knocked. The kingdom was in a sorry state, and despite High King Fiddleback's best efforts, lawlessness, lawlessness and disorder harried the kingdom at every turn. The cracks showed everywhere, and none could see it like the mice could. Mice were not the first choice of conversation for most folks, for they had their uses to see what others could not, and few of those spies were as insightful or as useful as Mr. Wright. He looked his brother over, the light flared and cast as he looked his brother over, the light flared and cast a scarlet shadow on the floor that Mr. Kine pretended not to see. Mr. Wright had a tiny marble for his left eye, the color of a ruby, highlighted by a scar from a rather angry cat. Wright walked with a tiny matchstick cane handed, hand-carved as a favor by, by a, a group of grateful turtles that he had helped to rescue. Mr. Kind wore a lush, shoot, lush suit tailor-made for him by a group of pixies and some silk provided by grateful spiders. Mr. Kind did favors for everyone, and in turn, everyone did favors for him. In the Rat Kingdom, he likely would have been called a fixer or a broker of some kind, but that simply wasn't what Mr. Kind did at all. He merely helped everyone and anyone who needed it, and the universe, recognizing the beauty and good in his heart, responded in kind. He immediately hugged his brother, sending the suit all a, fluff, a flutter with a quiet ruffling. It never got wrinkled. Right! So good to see you. How are you this fine morning? Not good. Something is troubling me. Mr. Kind wrinkled his nose and looked concerned. Being concerned for others was his specialty, after all. And that was doubly so where his brother was concerned. Of course. Let me fix us some tea. He motioned his brother over to a tiny kitchen, nestled at the edge of one of the great stained wind glass windows in the tapestry room, with due, which, due to some cleverly placed mirrors, had the effect of bathing the entire room in a glorious haze of bottle green and daffodil yellow. What seems to be the problem? There was no danger of interruption. Mr. Kind had the kind of luck that managed to give him just enough time in the day to help everyone who needed it or wanted it. He quietly poured the tea and slid a perfectly crafted goblin thimble cup to his brother. Mr. Wright took a deep breath. I'm not entirely sure where to begin. Then he thought for a moment. No, that's not true. I shall begin with my most recent assignment. The High King sent me to spy on some of his children. There's nothing unusual about this, per se. He is a monarch with powerful abilities and more powerful children. He has to keep his wits and his awareness about him. No one wants a repeat of the Augusta Sunfire incident. Still, there was something unusual about the way he asked me. I can't quite put a finger on exactly what it was. It wasn't the tone of voice, or the inflection of his eyes, or the words he chose. I watched, smelled, and listened. It wasn't anything that shows up with conventional senses. Mr. Wright was uncomfortable with the mystic, and preferred to deal with what he could see, smell, hear, and touch. But sometimes it was inevitable. Call it pure instinct. Each of his children has been behaving as they usually do, but in their case they did not mask it as well as the High King. They are, were, are, worried about something. There's a great deal of change coming, something that will shake the world to its core. I have heard them hint at something in talking to each other, though unfortunately without magic I can only hear half the conversation. A series of chimes sounded in the distance, as the master clock was informing the majority of first shift workers it was time for them to finish and head home, leaving way for the second shift to take place. Mr. Wright look, briefly looked up from his tea, as if expecting to sense something from the chime, took a sip, and continued. I think the worst part is, 
I kept their restlessness from the High King. Now, Mr. Kine would look truly shocked. It was one thing for Wright to hide something from a minor client or someone who did not need to know. But for Mr. Wright to hide something from their sovereign was entirely unheard of. Why? I, I don't know. I cannot say why this terrible dread has filled me. Perhaps it is because I am worried he will punish his family based on mere, merely vague conjecture. Or perhaps it is because I feel it is not yet time for him to know. I am unsure, and I do not like being unsure. I have many sources, of course, but I wanted to speak to someone who knows me best. Do I seem off to you, perhaps under enchantment? Pensively, Mr. Kind looked at Mr. Wright for several moments. He sniffed the air a few times and then looked around. Finally, he shook his head. No, I think your fit is a fiddle. You are sure when you are right and cautious when you are not. Nothing makes you more than that, brother. Makes you more you than that, brother. Mr. Wright's chest swelled with pride at that, and he smiled, but humbly did not say anything. He merely nodded to Mr. Kind and then considered, Then if there is nothing wrong with me, then I feel we must speak with someone who is able to see things that are not so easily seen. The invisible pianist. Too frivolous. The bishop of the magnificent stair. Too close to the high king. The oracle of altruism. Too unpredictable. The scum of the earth. We do not get along well. Mr. Kind thought for a good long while and then finally suggested, The Royal Library has a sage that is said to analyze any books that are being deposited there. He has been given a lens that reveals all salient details about whatever one gazes upon it with. Hmm. Mr. Wright stapled his fingers and considered, It might work. I have sensed the wrong thing. And thus some magical connection to have some magical connection to it. But I must admit that I find it a bit mundane for such an esoteric phenomena. Still, he is harmless enough that if we are skillful in the asking, we should be able to learn most of what we need. Mr. Kine smiled widely. Well, then, I think I should join you. Hmm. For a human, it was but a journey from one side of the city to the other. A bit of a height, but not unbearable. It might take them half an hour, but for a mouse, that was another matter entirely. I have lovely, of course. The High King had a large dove that took Mr. Wright wherever he needed to go, complete with a masterful saddle. But what shall you do? Ah, that's easy. I shall call in a favor with Frosty Loops. The toucan had been sum summoned by a visiting vizier from another land, and had stuck around the kingdom due to its temperate climes and abundance of fruit. But he also had the highly annoying habit, from Mr. Wright's perspective, due to his, to his long-winded stories involving breakfast. He also sang too much, a vulgar eastern habit for which Mr. Wright had little tolerance outside of opera. I see. Laughing, Mr. Kine packed a small leather satchel full of some snacks and essentials. You need to learn to laugh more, brother. It will do you a world of good. Mr. Wright let out a single guffaw harumph that was expertly both an acceptance of the challenge without acknowledging it. They left the apartment and walked to a ledge on the outside of the stained glass window. It was said that in the chapel there was a window for every one of the High King's original seven sons and his first two wives, but two of them had been deliberately blocked to obscure the targets. Everyone wanted to forget the Sun Queen and Augusta, Sun Augusta Sunfire. Rebellion was a threat to everyone, and no one believed so more than Mr. Wright. The old ways were best, had kept them safe, and kept them honorable. Once they were able to look at the city of a hundred clocks, they each took out a tiny whistle. Mr. Kynes was made from an acorn, whittled down till it was as wide as his finger, while Mr. Wright was a, Mr. Wright's was a sil sliver of an elephant's tusk. Elephants never forget. A short while later, Lovely the Dove and Frosty Loops the Toucan arrived. Lovely had a perfect saddle that Mr. Wright mounted as any other might a horse, but Frosty Loops just picked up Mr. Kind in his talons. Both had flown before, but they never tired of it. But Mr. Wright was far more dignified compared to the whoops and shouts of Mr. Kind as they wove in and out of the spires. No one paid attention to Lovely, which was the idea, but everyone knew the toucan and waved hello 
a few miscreants threw pieces of fruit or bread, but everyone had but he had already eaten so a completely nutritious breakfast, and wasn't the least bit hungry. They both spoke an ave, but the mice were quite fluent. Lovely day for flying, isn't it? Lovely said. Dove humor was not exactly subtle. That it is. I think I enjoy the coffee the most. How did you get the coffee, Frosty Lou? I helped myself. Both birds laughed to themselves. Mr. Wright was less than pleased with the larceny, but he knew better than to lecture a toucan. He might as well, he might have listened to Mr. Kind. People listened to Mr. Kind. Mice are generally polite creatures, even when they are not actually polite, because they are small and, and in the grand scheme of things, understand how easy it is to crush them under the heel of a boot. Mice in the High King's domain had done a good job of using anthropomorphism, that almost anyone would never think of doing such a thing, but rare was the mouse who would ever give them an excuse to start. Needless to say, mice were never ever messengers, especially to people of great import. Eventually they arrived, despite the prattling between Lovely and Frosty Loops, which ultimately meant very little to our story. The Royal Library has a clock on top, and like every important building in the city, gifted from time to time when better men had ruled the city. There were twelve titles that everyone should read on top of the, the, the library, though many of them had been worn through the ages by meticulous neglect. The three that remained were The Prince by Machiavelli, The Complete Dramatica by Aristotle, and The Sins of Fairy Godmothers by Mandibus Fiddleback. The latter was featured at a position of noon, with a big and little hands currently struck noon. Thank you, Frosty Loops. I greatly appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind waiting a bit, I believe I could find a lovely cantaloupe for breakfast tomorrow. Much obliged, Governor, much obliged. Frosty Loops bowed to the mouse and began to go look for some Guinness. Mr. Wright rolled his eyes, but together the two brothers went inside. The librarian was already waiting. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book, Have Name Will Travel, at Amazon and other markets. RedAnvilCreative.com contains all our podcasts. Copyright 2023. To fight the forces of evil! Welcome to the secret commentary after the end of every episode, and I don't care if this ends up being scratchy, or you hear stomping in the background, or an airplane, or a lawnmower, because this is the secret commentary, so who the hell cares if the quality is good or bad? I don't even care. In case you haven't figured out, I should call this Air of Swamp Castle, because I had to go back and redo the main recording for this stupid thing for this stupid chapter like three times and then i had to <laughs> redo the commentary of all things so at this point i'm just about done um yeah it's a chapter there's two talking mice in it it's nice uh they are parts of me in some ways but they're also their own characters I like to be kind and think kindness is important, and I like to be right and think being right is important. Um, yeah, I love the fucking Toucan because he's hilarious, and he's a parody of two uses of Toucans, one for advertising breakfast cereal and the other for Guinness, so fuck it, uh, General Mills, and fuck it. Guinness.
both of which are fine brands and or slash umbrella brands for other products. But the fact of the matter is, is that Frosty Loops is a parody character. So fuck it. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, and Lovely's just some random demented dove that carries Mr. Right around. Um, there's, there's utterly nothing behind the character. It's just a fucking dove that talks in bird language and flies around and carries a mouse. It's the, probably, in my opinion, except for animals that don't talk, possibly the least interesting character. In fact, there's a couple of animals that don't talk that actually are more interesting than, uh, than Lovely the Dove. Lovely the Dove is a rat with wings. Anyway, it is early on a Sunday morning. Um, you want commentary. Uh, okay, commentary. Uh, life is short. And then you have to re-record your podcasts and die. Death is inevitable. Except for vampires and immortals from the Highlander and taxes. Taxes are also immortal. The idea of taxes, anyway. Death and taxes. Death and taxes and vampires are the only inevitable things. So vampires are not inevitable on Earth because they're not real. And even if they are real, I wouldn't acknowledge that they're real. And that would make them fall apart and go to crumble to dust. So that therefore vampires on Earth are not are not real. If somebody tells you vampires are real, you can refer them to this podcast. And I am definitively telling you vampires are not real. What do vampires have to do with this chapter? Absolutely fucking nothing. <laughs>